Hey, why don't you high five your neighbor? Just welcome them to Journey. Just say, man, you're looking good. Glad to have you here. Some of you guys are like, wow, it's my first time. I didn't know we were allowed to talk to people. Why don't you try to do this? Why don't you look at the other person and smile at them? Go ahead, try it. It's scary. You know, uh, some of you guys are like, wow, I, the church I came from was like the frozen chosen. We weren't allowed to smile. It was us four and no more, you know. Uh, we hope and pray that Journey Church will be a different experience for you. We really do believe that we should be known by our love, not what we're against, but what we're for. And you know what we're for? That would be you. Uh, we are believing in you. You're cheering you on. We named Journey Church for the reason, not only because it's a great band, but because we want you to follow the Lord on your life journey, to find your rhythm, to find your stride as it relates to you and your walk with God. Uh, along the way, we want to do that together. We want to cheer you on. Today is the Cleveland Marathon. A lot of people are running, skipping church. A lot of people are running. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of people on the side cheering them on to go for it and give them a high five and water along the way. That's what we want to be for as a church, cheering you on because you can make it and God has a great prize and rewards for you. Amen? I'm Jim Wilkes. I'm the lead pastor of Journey Church. My wife and I have been pastoring it for 15 years. We started 15 years ago uh, in a house with three couples and a cat. Um, the cat went missing week number two. I don't... Just can't explain that. Hint, hint. I'm Italian. No, I'm joking. No, that's not true. Uh, but uh, today I'm going to continue our series called Overflow. And here's, here's what we kind of how we are as a church. Uh, I'm extremely logical, black and white. And, and a lot of times God will uh, connect with me in my mind. And over time it kind of makes its way into my heart. Some of us might be a little reverse. We might, God speaks to our heart or our emotions, and little by little, you start to believe it, and he kind of connects you here. And neither way is wrong, but it's important that God connects you to your heart and your head, right? Your heart and your head. It's really important those two things are working together. The Bible says this, that protect your heart, it is the wellspring of life. For out of it, everything flows. It's really important you don't give your heart away to the wrong things. Next, it talks about that a, re a renewed mind is so important, that our mind can be renewed and have God thoughts. Now, an unrenewed mind would be the opposite. We don't have God thoughts. We have uh, worldly or carnal or, you know, sometimes we think the enemy thoughts. We've got to protect our mind. The Bible talks about putting on a helmet of salvation. What is that? That's kind of wild, right? Helmet of salvation. Well, knowing who you are and whose you are, that's salvation. That's protecting your mind. Today, I want to talk to you in both arenas. I want to talk to you in your heart, and I want to talk to you in your head. I want to kind of talk to you with your emotions a little bit, and uh, what's in my heart, what's in scriptures for you, but also I think it needs to renew your mind. Let's start here. I want you to say this with me. Say, God is and has more than enough. Now, heart and head. I'm logical. When I read that, I believe that in my heart. But my head says no. My head says no and struggles with that because there's been times I didn't have enough at the end of the month. Can I, anyone testify? All right. Okay. Sometimes when I read that, I'm like, well, God is enough if I get a second job. God's enough if I work harder. God's enough if I do this. Well, no, we have to believe in our heart and our head that God is and has more than enough. Can I get an old school amen? amen? We have to get that to our core. Why is this so important? We're living in a moment of our, in our world that things are a little tougher financially. Costs are up, up 30%, right? Things are real. I mean, you go to the movie theater, you got to get a loan. It's a real deal, right? We have a tendency to think when things are tough, what we must begin to do is close our hands Versus opening our hands. We close our hands and we hang on to things in our resources with a, a kung fu grip. Because we're like, you know what, I, I can't. Because what ha if something happens and God's like, listen, my economy is not closed hands, it's open hands. I want to talk to you heart and head today. Now, 
we're also a very practical church. Maybe you've never been to a church like this before. True transparency. We believe that you should know where your money goes. We believe you, when we're, we're planning for something or doing something, uh, changes in our church or what we feel the Holy Spirit saying to us. We like to say that we're presence, uh, we're presence led, performance driven. We're here from God and we move in that direction. We're also an all in, bet the farm kind of church. If God says do something, like we're doing it. Like we're starting a behavioral health center called Joshua Tree. Why? Because we felt like the Lord said it and we put our resources behind it. And because of that, man, because of you guys, man, God's doing incredible things, right? Let me show you something practically. Let me show you where we're at um, uh, overall. Every uh, quarter I give an update financially. And I thought let me give you an update where we're at in our giving as a church. Right now... 54% of our church is what we call starting givers. They're giving on average about six, a little bit over $6.50 weekly. It's about $332 a year. They're starting there. Uh, then we have those that maybe giving, are moving towards tithing. Uh, they're emerging, giving about $20 a week. That's about 21% of our church. The majority of our church give $20 or less a weekend. You can kind of add to the math there, about 70, uh, 75% of our church is in that little, that lane right there, if you will. Core, uh, about $57 a week. Uh, intermediate, about $100. High capacity, just under $200 a week. Now, if you do that $200 a week or $100 a week, uh, you, know, that's a, it's a, you know, you can do the math and figure that out. It's about $5,000 or $10,000 a year. And some people are tithing. Some people are moving towards tithing. Now, the reason I'm showing you that is because in most churches, it's 80% of the ministry is funded by about 15 to 20 percent of the church. That's historically been it. Let me tell you something about Journey Church, what God has called us to be. I believe that God has called us to be radically generous. That we can be radically generous, and here's why. Because our generosity sets the speed of the vision. God set the vision. We, as a church, set the speed of it. Now, when I saw this, some of you guys might be like, oh, man. Oh, I'm discouraged. Not me. I'm glasses half full kind of guy. Like, I'm overflow guy. That's the name of the series. Over, I saw that. I go, oh, snap. We got room for improvement. Oh, snap. God's about to do something great. Because here's what I know. If we can move from our understanding to God's principles, we see increase God's blessings and God's favor in our life. One amen. Two amens. Can I get an old school amen? There we go. That's a good place. Now, you can change. You can move that off. Now, let me say this to you. As we're talking about overflow and stewardship and generosity today, let me make this blanket statement. We are not a prosperity church. We understand that we give to give. There you go. Now, I understand that when we give, we have a heavenly father that loves to bless, right? Now, I was gone a couple days and... I don't mean to throw my son under the bus, but that's just how it's going to have to work today. When I got back, we discovered, he admitted it before we got home, I forgot to take out the trash. Right? And guess what happens when you miss a week of trash? The garage stinketh. I'm using old King James to tell you, old, make it spiritual. It stinketh the high heaven if. Right? We got a whole, no here's what I know. It takes a family for a family to work. And when we all do our part, we can do great things. But as a church, Journey Church, when some of us don't do our part in the capital C church, we're not all doing our part, sometimes the church winds up stinking. It misses its mark. It doesn't fulfill its purpose. So today I want to unpack generosity and stewardship. Let's just make sure we're clear on the same page. A tithe is the first and best 10% of what we earn. Now, if you're visiting today, today I'm having a, a journey, church, family conversation, and you get to kind of listen in, and there's no coercion or compulsion to participate in our offering at the very end of our service. This is kind of like a little bit of family talk here. We're talking about uh, our stewardship and fulfilling the vision that God has for us and operating in God's economy. Well, let's look at this. Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 through 5. Very interesting. It says, so it came to pass, going all the way back to Genesis, the, the Old Testament, it came to pass in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord from the fruit of the ground. That's really important to remember. In the process of time. Abel, on his part, also brought an offering from the firstborn 
of his flock and from their fat portions. So he didn't bring it in the process of time. He brought it first. And the Lord had regarded Abel's and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Some of your translations say this. He received Abel's offering and rejected Cain's offering. I mean, this is quite an interesting verse. Why did this happen? It's because Cain said, I'm going to take what is first, and I'm going to receive it for myself. And when I get to it, I'll bring God something, something. It could have been I waited 30 days. Instead of bringing God the first, I'm going to see what's left over. And whatever's left over, that's what I'll give. Cain, in essence, was saying, can I afford to give this month? Abel said, oh, no. I understand that everything I have belongs to God. I'm bringing my best, and I'm going to bring my best to the Lord first. Because I believe that God blesses the 90%, and that's better than the 100% left in my hand. Now look at Genesis chapter 14. It's another reference to giving and tithing, Old Testament. And Metzedek, the king of Salem, brought out wine and bread. Now he was uh, a priest of the Most High, and he blessed him and blessed Abraham. And he said, blessed be Abraham of God, Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And he blessed and, and be God, Most High, who has handed over the enemies to you. And he gave him a tenth of everything. So this was Abraham that he understood. He brought, God brought about a victory in his life. And what was his response to bring an offering? To bring the first fruits to Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek, he was a type of God. Now, there's uh, scriptures in the Bible, in the Old Testament, a uh, type of Satan, if you will. In the Old Testament, I'll give you one of them. A gentleman named Adonai Bezek. It translates Lord Lightning. And he was a type of the enemy, a type of Satan in the Old Testament. And there's a lot of principles that go with it. But on the opposite side, Melchizedek was actually a type of God. And here the very first response of Abraham is I'm going to bring my offering to a, a God-like authority. And I'm not going to only give to, to the person. I'm giving through, to the, through the person to God. I bring it to the local church. I understand my victory happened because of God. And I'm going to bring the first fruit of the spoils to God. Now, after service today, I really thinking about taking my wife out for lunch. But unfortunately, I ain't got no money. I sure wish I had some money. Uh, oh, you, I can have some? Oh, thank you, Joel. You're such a good son. Thank you, Joel, for giving me this dollar. I'll buy mom a nugget. Just a single nugget. Just one nugget. How did I know Joel was going to give me this dollar? Because I gave it to him. Before the service, I said, hey, Joel. In the middle of the service, I'm going to ask you for a dollar. Now, because he's a good son, and because I asked for it, he brought it to me. Good job, Joel. You know what, son? I'm really proud of you. You just have really, you know what? Can you hang on to this for me, this $20? Just hang on that for a little bit. And the reason I can give that to him is because he's trustworthy with a dollar. And because he was trustworthy with a dollar, I can kind of say, hey, I, I want to I kind of put more in your hands. Man, I'm so proud of you. You see, the, the tithe actually belongs to God, and we don't give it, we actually bring it. Because you can't give what isn't yours. You bring what is God's. And we bring it back to the Lord because we're saying, God, you are our source, and you, God is, and you, you have more than enough, and I will trust you. You know what, Joel? I think I'm going to splurge today. I'm going to get mom more than a nugget. So I really wish I could have more than a dollar. So, uh, Joel, can I? Thank you so much. Thank you for stewarding that for me. Chipotle. One ball, guac for you, baby girl. $21. You know what, Joel? Because you are such a great steward, I, I just want you to hang on to this. $100 there, okay. Just take care of that for me, okay. Now, can I say this to you, just real practical. Like I said, I, I like to read scripture and have revelation, but I like to break it down where I can put feet to my faith. Some of us 
God puts this in our hands and we never release it. We never release it because we're afraid. If I release this, I have nothing. And God says, no, if you don't release it, I can't put something better in its place. Now here's the challenge. Now stay with me. Here's what I see all the time. We give it to the Lord. We bring back the tithe to Him. There's a season we feel like our hand is empty. And we go back and we grab it back. Because something's better than nothing. Security. Sometimes when we give it, have you ever noticed the washing machine breaks down? Someone hits your car and takes off when you're at Walmart? <laughs> we want to close our hand back up. But when we do that, we actually miss out when God wants to put something better in its place. By the way, I'll tell you this. Uh, Pastor, I'll just start tithing when I have more money. If you don't tithe here, wow. you'll never tithe here. Yeah. It's just really zeros. It's a heart issue. It's not a numerical issue. If you don't tithe here, you'll never tithe here. And sure enough, Joel can have that. You'll definitely never, ever tithe here. Because here's why. If you ever get this and you get to this level and you're not tithing, let me tell you something. You'll hang on to it because you're afraid of losing it. Tithing actually breaks the spirit of greed off your life. Most people I know, and let me tell you this, this is not a lower class, middle class, or higher class issue. Every single person struggles. Most people I know that have a lot of zeros in their bank account have the fear of losing it. Not making it, losing it. A lot of times when we're in middle class or lower class, we have fear of making it. If I get rid of it, I'll never have enough. Where does this come from? This comes from a scarcity mindset, right? Malachi says this, bring the whole tithe to the store. Bring it. You don't give it. You bring it. So that there might be food in my house, being his church, and put me to this test. Now, I want you to see something. Put me to the test, says the Lord of armies, if I do not open up the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. What is he talking about? I'm going to bless what you're giving, and then 90%, I'm going to bless it and create overflow for what? Not for you, but for the other nations is what it was talking about. For those that are having economic issues and your neighbor, your coworker, those that you're, you, you are going to school with and you find out that they only have one pair of shoes, teenagers, and you go home to mom and dad and you say, mom, my friend, uh, Mark, he, he has only one pair of shoes and it's kind of embarrassing because they're being worn out. You know what, daughter? We have overflow. Let's buy a pair of shoes. That's where it should come from. Not, oh my gosh, we don't have enough. This is what God wants to change. We are meant to be a blessing to other people. But unfortunately, the local church, by that diagram I showed you, we, number one, we're in debt, which is financial peace. We, we would love for you to join it, Financial Peace University. Number two, we need you to get out of debt. Number two, operate by God's kingdom principles so you can receive a blessing in your life and be a blessing to other people outside the four walls of this church. Can I get an Amen. Now, we all see God's blessings through obedience, right? And I want to bless my kids all the time, right? But if they don't clean their room, guess what I don't want to do? Bless them. When they don't take the trash out, guess what I don't want to do? Bless them. Where does this come from? People say, I can't afford to tithe. I want to show you. Scarcity says this, there will never be enough. There will never be enough. And scarcity, like I said, doesn't, is not just a, it doesn't care if we're poor, if we're middle class, lower class, or rich. Either way, it's like if I can make a little bit more, then I'll be safe, then I'll be content. And John chapter 8 says the enemy is a father of lies, and that is a lie from the enemy. That if I have enough, I'll finally be happy. If I make a little bit more, I'll finally be content. If I add a one more car, a bigger house, another this, another that, then I'll finally be safe. That is a lie. Let me tell you something. You're never safe. Unless we follow God and put our life and our ways in his hands. 
Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. For God knows in that day you'll eat, eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. This is speaking to Adam and Eve. Why did Adam and Eve fall and partake of the fruit that God asked them not to? Because of comparison. Man, if I have this, I'll be like. And the moment they compared their lives to something they didn't have, they went to a life of comparison and scarcity, and sin entered the equation. Scarcity is always rooted in lies and comparison. Man, if I had this, if I had this TV, my small groups would be better. Man, if I had these shoes, man, it'd be awesome. You know, I remember my kids were younger. They were like, Dad, Mom, you never, you never let us have any fun. Never. Are you serious? Never. <laughs> never. We never can do anything. You guys are mean. Oh, really? Never. What about when you went to Disney World? What about when you went to Sea World every week with your Mimi and Papa with season passes? What about vacations every year? What about your trip to D.C. and we got to see your monuments? What about as you grew up, Cedar Point? Pass, pass. You spoiled little rotten. No, no. <laughs> Niagara Falls twice. So you never got to do these things? Never. You're mean. Listen, I didn't get to go to like a Cavs basketball game until I was like 32. They're going like at 10. You never, ever got to go? Here's the thing. It's comparison. Students, listen to me. Do not compare your life to your friends. Do not compare your TikTok and your Instagram to everybody else. It will sap the joy out of your life. If I look like them or have like them or dress like them, then I'll finally be happy. Contentment does not come by adding things to your life, but celebrating what you do have. Now, I love our Avon campus, but I'm, I'm just going to be transparent with you. You know, at Fairview Park, there's like... 14 parking spaces, right? And when we started Journey Church, we made it happen. I mean, we had uh, one time valet service, and we, we ran that campus close to 1,000 people. It was a lot of work in that campus when we started Journey Church. Man, it was a lot of work. And then we built this campus, and I'm like, I love this campus. We have a parking lot. Then all of a sudden, I'm like, we need more space. People parking in the grass. We got geese. I hate those geese. <laughs> I saw some of you chasing them down. <laughs> I love you. And then pretty soon I'm looking at the building, I'm not happy with the building anymore. I go to another church and I see what they have, and I'm like, man, that would be nice too. Man. And the very thing I used to bless, I'm now cursing. We're packed to the gills. Trying to figure out how to add services. We add a Sunday on Thursday. We're trying to figure out, do we add another one here at Avon? Fairview Park's growing. Twinsburg's growing. And all, that. and all I can find is what's not working and what everyone else has versus blessing what God has already given us. God, will you forgive us for complaining for what you put in our hands? God, I only make $15 an hour. God, I only make $20 an hour. God, I'm not this person. God, I can't believe I owe taxes. Lord, I want to thank you. That because of you, you always have taken care of us. Sure, I don't know how we're going to pay this, but I know that God is and has more than enough, and I believe it, and I'm going to follow your principles because you are true, you are faithful, and you're able to get it to me, and you're able to get it through me, and you've never let me down. God, I don't need another TV. I know my TV is from 1984, but I don't need another TV. It still works, rabbit ears. Look at 2 Corinthians, I want to read this over you, not just to you. And God is able to make all grace overflow to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, that means to completeness, 
You may have an abundance for every good deed. Look what it is. God is giving it to you to get it through you, church, that you have enough for every good deed. I pray the remainder of the second half of this year and that the, the remaining part of this year is that you are a blessing to your neighbors and your co-workers and God gets it to you and when you have extra in your hands, you don't consume it. You put it aside and say, oh my gosh, that's for outreach. That's going to take care of my neighbors. This is going to be for someone in our church. This is for a backpack giveaway. This is to send someone to camp. I'm not going to consume myself. Sure, I can get an extra pair of shoes, but overflow. Now he who supplies seed to the sower. Now look what it says. Seed to the Look at the progression. This person is following biblical order. God's blessing is upon their life. And then he says, now. You're following divine order. Verse 10, it hinges. It's, a, it's like a pendulum. Now he who supplies seed to the sower. Who's the sower? You. He's saying, the very thing that you have, the 90%, I'm going to supply and now I'm going to multiply it for sowing to increase the harvest of your, in your righteousness. Not the 100%. 90%. Now that you're following biblical order, because the first 10% has to be blessed, and for it to be blessed, has to be given away. Has to be brought back to the Lord. And then he says, now I'm going to bless the rest of your seed that it multiplies and has the increase that it wouldn't have had unless you followed my order. When he, Paul wrote this the, to the Corinthians, he told them to prepare a generous financial offering above and beyond to bless the Macedonian church that was struggling. And he said, I want you to give whatever you can give. Now remember, you can't outgive God. And they, ha they had every reason to live in scarcity. They were under persecution themselves. But they chose in their pressure and obscurity to go above and beyond to bless another church. See, generosity is always rooted in truth and gratitude. Matthew 10, 8 says this, if you freely, you freely received, you freely give. See, what God is asking us to do is will we be stewards of what is already his? And here's the reality. God can come to us and say, hey, the moment you give your life to Christ, 100% is all mine. But he says, no, what I want is stewardship and I want your heart. So the moment I gave this to Joel, and I said, will you hang on to this for me, son? This was about me trusting his heart and his ability to steward. See, if he would have ran out and spent it for himself, and then I came back and said, Joel, can I have what is mine? He said, oh, no, I spent it. And I said, but it's mine. I know I had the heart I said, well, it can't just be a heart thing, Joel. It has to be a hand thing, too. You have to have the heart and the hand to steward it. You see, if all of a sudden Joel gave it, fine. <laughs> it's just a mean dad. Just because I didn't take the trash out. <clears throat> now we have a problem. Because it's a hand thing, but his heart's not in it. When we give, it's the hand and the heart. Some, that's why he says, do not give under compulsion, but give generously, joyfully. I get to bring this back to God. I get to steward the things of God. I get to take the trash out because my dad asked me to and I won't forget. <laughs> Joel, Joel's never going to forget this. He's like, I'm not driving home with you, dad. But when we listen and we obey, man, it moves to the heart of God. Amen? Today, like I said, we're going to end our time by receiving our tithe and our offerings. Why are we doing it this way? Normally we do it earlier after worship as an act of worship. But today I want to do it as an act of faith that we're putting feet to our faith and we're trying. Uh, Pastor Elijah, can I have that card right there? Thank you so much. Now, you received this card right here. It's an it's a, it says, in the next 90 days, I believe in God for. Uh, I want you to write on here what you're believing God for. Because our staff and our leadership, we want to pray for you for breakthrough. 
as many of you are taking this step of giving or tithing, I want you to write it down on here. Many people have filled it out. We put it on the boards in the back so we can pray over it. But on the back of it, there's a bold decision to make. Here's what it is, unapologetically. is one, to set up reoccurring giving through overflow. Number two, you say, Pastor, I'm going to take the 90-day tithing challenge. I'm just going to do it. We've already had well over 50, 70 people say yes to the tithing challenge. I'm congratulating them and celebrating them. But here's the deal. If you're like, Pastor, I'm scared out of my mind. I've never done this in 15 years. The first week I felt compelled to do this, and I'm just going to follow that leading. If you're like, Pastor, I'm going to take the 90-day tithing challenge, but I'm scared, I'm nervous. What if it doesn't work? What if God doesn't come through? I'm going to give you the 90-day tithing challenge and say at the end of 90 days, if you feel like it doesn't work, we'll just write a check and give you your tithe back. That's how confident I am. You know, my boys, they're older now, about to be 22 and 19. I really can't make them do anything. I coached them my whole life and tried to put God's principles in them. And they'll make decisions, and Joel and Josh will come up to me and say, Dad, can I ask you a question? I'm like, sure. I'm thinking about doing this. And here's my responses. That's a decision. Do you want me to listen to you, or do you want my advice? Well, Dad, I want your advice. Well, if you do that, then this. But if you do this, then this is going to happen, I think. You can do that but I don't think it's going to have the return you want. As long as you're okay with the consequences. But if you do this, you don't have to listen to do, do the school of hard knocks like your dad did. I kind of know. Because I'm old. Dad, I think I'm going to trust you. This is the same thing. You could steward your finances 100%. You could do that. That is a decision. It does have ramifications to it, right? Or, hey, I'm going to do it God's way and bring to him his tithe because I can trust him because he is and always will be more than enough. Now, I'm a logical person, and that's how I see it in my life. Maybe that helps you as you're making a decision today. Maybe it's here. Maybe it's here. God, today, I'm yielding my heart to you. I've been fighting you. I'm giving you my finances because I've been trusting the work of my hands. And today, I'm going to surrender my heart, the spirit of greed or poverty, the fear of lack, striving. I'm going to surrender it to you. I want you to take this card, hold it in your hand. We're going to pray over it. Then our ushers are going to come forward and receive our offering. If you're giving in the offering today and you're making out a check or cash, please put it in an envelope. A variety of ways you can give. You may have a journey church, or if you're giving through our new platform, you just tap your phone on that overflow circle, uh, and it will bring everything up, and you can uh, give through that platform there. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you as our ushers come to receive our offering. Lord, today we heard the word. We're going to apply the word. Lord, I have no doubt in my mind there are those that are giving for the first time. Maybe there are those that are increasing their generosity and moving towards tithing. We celebrate their obedience. Lord, I believe when we are obedient to the word of God, it breaks the back of the enemy. It breaks generational curses. It breaks that spirit of poverty, of debt off of our life. When we act in obedience and we put you first in our worship, in our life, in our finances, in our relationships. Man, you do amazing things. Today, we're practicing. We're going to work very hard at surrendering our resources, our hand and our heart. We trust you that you are our source. For those that are taking the 90-day tithing challenge, I pray for faith and boldness to arise in them. They're ripping the band-aid off and saying, I'm just going to do it. I've always wanted to. I'm just going to trust the Lord that he, you are who you say you are. And we honor you and we bless your name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Hey, after you're done giving, please stand to your feet and worship with us. And then your campus pastor will come and close us out.